before. Welcome everybody. My name is George Yagatik. I'm the training and engagement facilitator and I'm proud to be a part of the ACES Aware Initiative. Uh, I, uh, the initiative itself trains providers to better define adverse childhood experiences, their prevalence and their impacts on health, including underlying biologic mechanisms. I have a clinical background in creative arts therapy and have worked in both outpatient and inpatient acute care. My experience has a strong foundation in patient-centered care and is resiliency-based, and I feel strongly about the work and the current changes that are taking place in the field. I'm excited about being here today to bring you this information. Our agenda today is as follows. We've uh, gone through our welcome and introductions. We're going to dive into Mentimeter, uh, do some talk about assessing a uh, little bit about the clinical staffing model implementation of the screening tool, and then hopefully have time for a, a brief roundtable discussion. I'd like to welcome, I see that uh, Teresa Alvarado has joined us, and I'm wondering, Teresa, if you'd like to unmute yourself and just give yourself a brief introduction to the people that are here today. Thank you, George. Good morning. I'm sorry I'm a little late. I work uh, in a team at Aetna that includes people on the East Coast. So believe it or not, this is my second meeting this morning. So um, I work for Ed and I'm uh, the outreach, um, one of the outreach managers and I'm always happy to be here and always happy to learn. Uh, good morning to everyone. Wonderful, thank you, Teresa. Good morning to you too, glad you're with us. All right, for those of you that are familiar with Mentimeter, go ahead and grab your phone, your cell phone, and type in www.menti.com. And what we're going to be doing is answering a couple brief questions. The code is 301792216. Our first question is Have you taken the ACEs aware? provider core training. Have you taken the core training? So we've got about one, two, three, four, five. We've got six, seven people in attendance. Let's see how many we can get to answer. This is on your cell phone. Go to, go to www.menti.com and use the code 30179216. Again, that's 30179216. Have you taken the ACES Aware Provider core training? And let's see how many we have here. We've got two so far at yes and one at no. Three, can we get anybody? Can we get some more people? Here we go. We got four, three, four, five, six, seven. And we've got seven. Seven people. Let's see. We've got five. Great. A couple more people. George, can you repeat the code, please? I can't read it on my cell phone. And you're saying it way too fast for this early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that, Mark. Yeah, the code is 3017 and yep. 9216. 3017 9216. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we do have a lot of information, so I tend to speak quickly. I'm sorry about that, Mark. I will try to uh, speak up. No worries. There we go. All right. So we've got five yes, we've got two no's. I'm glad to see that we have a, uh, a large number of people who have taken the core training so you have that foundational understanding of ACEs and all that it entails. Let's move on to the next question. Do you use the algorithm? The algorithm, if you're familiar with the algorithm, we're going to be showing that. Um, do you use the algorithm? Uh, this would be in conjunction with the screening tool, the algorithm uh, identifies whether somebody is at low, medium, or high risk of adverse health conditions. See, this is where the definition of utilize for somebody who's organizing others to do it becomes a little hazy, but I assume you mean for a direct service provider. Exactly, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As a direct service provider, do you actually use the algorithm in conjunction with the screening? And I see here, yes, we have a preponderance of no's. I'm just going to make sure that everybody is familiar with the algorithm, algorithm as we move forward today. And, um, and I'm seeing that we have most people here who are on 
our nose on the algorithm. So George, does that mean, this is Teresa, I'm gonna ask a question. Since I'm not a provider, there would, I'm actually not even familiar. I know what an algorithm is in the general sense, but I've never heard it in an ACE meeting. So is it because I'm not a provider that I'm not familiar with it? Well, Teresa, I'm so glad you asked. We're going to get you familiar with the algorithm today. It's a specific algorithm to use in conjunction with the ACE screen tool that uh, determines if somebody is at low, medium, or high risk of adverse health conditions. And I'll be showing you the algorithm later on in the presentation. So I'll make sure to uh, check in with you to, to see that if you have any questions around it, but you, by the end of the presentation, will be familiar with the algorithm. All right, I believe this is our last question. Are you connected with a network for referrals? Uh, a network of care. If you have been to our network of care, you are part of the King's Referral Network, the King's Exchange, uh, or if you are part of a network of care in your county, whether it's Unite Us, uh, Aunt Bertha, are you connected with the network of care for referrals? So we've got a Okay, we've got mostly yeses, which is great because being connected to that network is so important. So I, I don't think I know, I, I didn't know what you meant. So I think I am, so, but I, but I really don't know enough about it. So <laughs> this is really great, thank you. You bet, Sylvia. And uh, you know, a, a network for referrals is so important and there's different ways to, to be connected to uh, networks. One thing I want to stress here is next Monday we have our network of care meeting from 2 to 3.30 and that would immediately help you connect to a network that is already established and doing some really good work here um, not only in Kings County but throughout the Central Valley. So if you really want to solidify your connection to a strong network that is uh, that is underway and being built, and might I say, being led by our program manager, Linda Baggio, come to our network of care meeting uh, this coming Monday from 2 to 3.30. All right. We've got, uh, again, mostly uh, four who are and uh, two who are not. And so hopefully we will, we will, by the end of this meeting, motivate people to not only take the core training, but connect to a network of care that is that is doing some or having some good traction and um, in the Central Valley. Can I ask a quick question for those that aren't in the Central Valley? Is that number one, is the training open for everyone? Because that's one thing I was a little hesitant because I didn't know if I could even do it. The training that we have here, um, I'll, I'll be talking about, there's the core training that ACE is aware runs, and there's what, uh, so we have supplemental trainings, both clinical and non-clinical, and that's through King's, uh, the King's uh, County Network of Care. Um, both trainings are open to anybody, no matter where you're located. So absolutely, and we'll be talking about that in just a little bit. To start off with, why screen for ACEs and toxic stress? There's a couple different points that I'd like to touch on. Adverse childhood experiences are a preventable root cause of numerous costly health conditions and social challenges. Identification of exposure to ACEs and other risk factors for toxic stress through universal and routine ACE screenings, it helps clinicians provide more effective, equitable, specific, and high quality health care. It may also ultimately reduce healthcare costs. Toxic stress is what we're looking at, and it is treatable. A consensus of scientific data demonstrates that early detection and early intervention is associated with improved outcomes related to toxic stress. Preventing ACEs, screening to assess the risk of toxic stress, which is the algorithm we'll be talking about, and effectively responding with evidence-based trauma-informed care in the healthcare setting and across sectors can significantly improve the health and well-being of individuals and families for generations. And that's exactly what we're doing here is, is working to improve the health and well-being of our community. 
So uh, the first point I'd like to make is that ACE screening supports health promotion, prevention, and effective treatment of illness. A body of research shows that negative outcomes associated with ACEs are preventable through early detection and prompt intervention. Second point I'd like to make is that ACE screening helps clinicians and patients form stronger therapeutic relationships. And this is an important point because most doctors don't think that a screening tool would actually help relationships. ACE screenings also provide a tool for conversation that can improve the patient-clinician relationship, a cornerstone of quality healthcare shown to result in better treatment plans and improved outcomes. Third point I'd like to address is that ACE screening can improve clinical decision-making and treatment of serious and difficult to treat health conditions. Now, ACEs, for most of you who are familiar with, ACEs are strongly associated in a dose-response fashion with some of the most common and serious health and social conditions facing our society today, including nine out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the US. ACEs lead to increased health risk through a health condition called the toxic stress response. And we've talked about this in previous trainings and other meetings like this. It's really the toxic stress response that is key to understanding the adverse health conditions. Many of the conditions considered hardest to treat by clinicians such as abdominal pain, obesity, addictions, and mental health are among those associated with ACEs. ACE screening provides an efficient way for clinicians to identify patients who may be at risk for toxic stress and ACE-associated health conditions. So with early uh, identification, targeted interventions are likely to be more effective and less expensive in patients who may already be experiencing ACE-associated health conditions. Clinicians can work toward the goal of regulating the toxic stress response and counteracting the disruptions in the long word here, neuroendocrine, immune, metabolic, and genetic regulatory function that characterize it. So again, early detection is so important in treating toxic stress. Today, we're looking at milestones for providers and clinics. We have previously in, in uh, previous meetings uh, undertaken milestone five, monitor, evaluate, and improve the referral process. Today, we are doing a readiness assessment. And what does it take to really begin and embrace that readiness assessment? What is a readiness assessment? These are the elements of the readiness assessment. Assessing the number of providers and staff who have completed the ACEs core training, which is partly why we asked the question. Number one, education, get that core training in. Ensuring that providers attest to having completed the training. We'll talk about what attesting is. It's just noting down that you have taken the, the training publicly on the ACEs Aware website. Identifying ACEs related training resources for staff. What other trainings are out there? We've already had these questions come up. Uh, the Kings County ACEs Network of Care has supplemental trainings that we have on Learn Worlds that we'll be talking about. And those are available for additional trainings past the core training. Assessing clinical staffing model to identify the in internal resources to support referral and response activities. Um, implementing an ACEs screening tool, response algorithm, there we go, in clinical workflow. Incorporating trauma-informed care into and across your practice, which is so very important. And finally, engaging with your community to understand resources that will make up an effective network of care. It's a lot of information. This is really what we're going to be going through today in the best, uh, most efficient <laughs> uh, manner possible. To start off with, it's training and education. It's critical for leadership, clinical and non-clinical staff to understand the core concepts of ACE screening, assessing the risk of toxic stress, and how evidence-based interventions and trauma-informed care can improve health outcomes. So when assessing training among providers and staff, what processes do you currently have in place to document completion of trainings for continuing education among providers and staff? How can you supplement these processes to ensure all staff and providers have completed the ACEs core training? Something to think about. The ACEs aware uh, provider attestation data is self-reported information 
provided by individuals who have self-attested to completing a certified core ACES Aware Provider Core training. The value of attestation provides placement on the map, ability for others to find a trained ACE Aware practitioner, and a sense of security for patients to know that you will provide the best practices of a trauma-informed practitioner. In addition, it offers the opportunity to be connected to a network of care where providers can acquire resources and community resources to refer patients. Now, just to clarify, when you complete the core training on the ACEs Aware website, you then follow through with a simple attestation saying, yes, I have completed this training, and you are put on a map, an actual map, on the ACEs Aware webpage so that people can find those clinicians who have actually completed that core training one part of the training, um, but it's it's one way to find somebody who has more information and is educated about uh, trauma-informed care. So there are numer numerous resources that are tailored uh, to you through the Kings County ACEs Network of Care Collaboration. That's, that's our organization uh, and the work that we're doing. We have developed a self-paced learning platform to encourage provider access at their own time. This is our Learn Worlds access and our Learn Worlds um, uh, course platform. I'm going to see if I can't put, let me see, pardon me for a moment, I'm gonna put this in the chat. Okay, if you are not familiar with uh, ACES Aware, there is the link for ACES Aware. Um, these are the resources available for training and education. If you want to find out a little bit about ours, the, the ACES Aware Network of Care, our supplemental trainings, you can go to the next link, the California Health Collaborative Learn Worlds uh, site. And finally, our last one I'm putting here in the chat, a lot of stuff that's going in the chat today. This is our ACEs Aware Assessing Readiness, Building Resilience in the Clinical Workforce, a foundation for ACE screening integration link that you can check out. Later on in the assessment, we're going to look at some of the hurdles and some of the challenges that we face when doing these screenings. Um, we don't see anything in chat. Oh, I sent these to, yes. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. Let's try this one more time. The first one is the ACES Aware link. The second one is Learn Worlds. Learn Worlds has the uh, Kings County Network of Care. Uh, supplemental training and the third one there we go is the aces aware learning training and education one of the most important aspects of the beginning of any readiness and preparation work that you're going to be doing i'd like to hear i'd like to show you a brief video from somebody who underscores the importance of education in this process. Now let's start with our first question for Dr. Bernard Pearl. Before you started ACE screening, what were some strategies or steps that you took to implement and what were some of the lessons you learned from this process? Before we started ACEs screening here at Pediatrics, uh, we did. Dec we decided to do a um, pretty extensive training of all of our staff. Definitely wanted to train our medical providers and our nurses, but we also felt it was really important that the whole clinic understand this initiative because the way we thought about it from the beginning is that um, the ACEs screening. It's really not like other screening questionnaires. It's kind of unique and it asks such personal information. We thought it would make a lot of sense if everyone understood why we were asking all of these 
very personal questions and kind of get everybody on the same page. We looked at it as kind of a shift in our culture because we were really shifting um, the way we were approaching primary care. So the training involved everybody. And a really important part of the training, what worked really well was that we introduced the science of ACEs so everybody could understand how extremely important uh, someone's adverse childhood experiences are in terms of their health in the future. And then we we distributed the questionnaire itself to everyone. We didn't um, we didn't ask everyone to complete it or sh or share their personal information, but we did want everybody to experience thinking about all of those questions um, and what it might be like to answer that as a patient here in the clinic. One of the lessons learned was that ACEs affect well. We kind of knew this this to be true, but then when it actually um, when it actually happened this way, it was kind of a lesson that ACEs are very common and many of our staff members have experienced significant childhood trauma. Um, so that was a lesson in the sense that it was, um, it helped us to be more sensitive, like thinking about our own traumatic past that we may have had helped us feel more um, sensitive to our patients' experiences too. So that was one lesson, was um, to be more sensitive by experiencing the screening ourselves. Now let's start with our first question. Okay. One of the things I really love about that video is that she, she in the rollout of in uh, beginning utilizing the screening, she had the staff take the screening tool to really understand the feelings that kicked up when filling out that form. Now, with regard to the screening tool, there are two tools uh, for adults to use. One is identified and one is de-identified. And for those of you that are familiar with, the identified tool actually shows where which uh, trauma, which ACE you have experienced. And the de-identified one just has a cumulative total at the bottom and it doesn't indicate which specific ACE one might have experienced. And there are big differences in terms of how how it, how it feels to identify and notate, annotate which ACE you may have experienced. We recommend, I think best practices show that the de-identified screening tool is best to use for primary care providers um, as, it, as it does, it, it's, it prevents re-traumatization and it allows for a little bit more safety for the person filling out the tool. If you have not filled out uh, an ACE screening tool before, I highly encourage you to do so. And um, just keep in mind how it feels to answer the questions uh, noted. All right, uh, Linda, we got we have a comment from Yes. Love the love that the integration allowed them to not only serve their clients, but also understand the staff experiences. Absolutely. I'd like to show you briefly, this is the ACEs Aware webpage. Now, for those of you, and we have a couple who have not taken the core training, this is where to go, acesaware.org. And in big yellow box over here on the right-hand side is Get Certified. If you hit that Get Certified, it will take you directly to the training page where you can start the training right here at Login or Create an Account. And that this training is uh, becoming ACE, ACEs Aware in California, the core training. Uh, it's a free two-hour training to learn about ACEs, toxic stress, screening, risk assessment, and evidence-based care to effectively intervene in toxic stress. So again, this is the place to go for that core training so very important. It's also a place to go for additional resources that are available. I'll show you that quickly. Um, if we if we go back to the web page, I will pull that up for you. And show you briefly where the resources are located. Right here, uh, at the very top, they have events, grants, resources, blog, and about, and then the Get Certified button. Resources are listed here, and the resources are broken down by type. 
by topic and by resources by stage. I like to start off with clinical resources for adult providers. And if you click on that, you have a, an entire range of um, uh, white papers, videos, uh, uh, infographics, and anything you can think of, uh, articles with regards to uh, working with adults with ACEs. Uh, so for example, here's Dr. Nadine Burke Harris's TED Talk. And uh, if you have not seen the TED Talk, I highly encourage you to check that out. Tons of resources on the acesaware.org webpage. All right, the next part, staffing and resources, partly what we've been going over. The next- Excuse me, George. Yes, Mark. Could I interject uh, for the folks who are out of state, you might think, oh, that's just for California or I'm not a medical provider, so it doesn't, I can't do it. Uh, it is really a great training. It actually ta can take you four hours to do it if you're do it, pacing yourself over time. But, uh, but I highly encourage you to do it if you haven't done it already. Uh, I'm not a medical provider, but I got certified as taking it. I don't get any credit. I don't bill for it or anything like that. But it's a very well organized training and there are several case studies that you can choose from. You could, they ask you to do two to begin with and then four out of a list of, I think it's nine, right, George? Uh, but you could do them all if you wanted to, but they're excellent ways of testing your knowledge and they give you a little bitty test. <laughs> they don't slap your hand or anything, but it, it's an excellent resource. I highly encourage you to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes, absolutely. The, the core training is really incredibly helpful. And you're right. I love the case studies myself. It really gets you a hands-on feel of what the doctors are going through. So yeah, those case studies are, are, are really informational. With regards to the next, the next step in this process, which is staffing, you need to assess your clinical staffing model to identify the internal resources to support referral and response activities, such as staff who could serve as care coordinators, uh, referral source co-located within your clinic system, and if not, changes that could be made to facilitate a smooth referral and response uh, process. So staffing is really important. Uh, we understand the health systems vary widely in types and, uh, in types and the number of staff members available. Some may have a doctor, one or two nurses, and front desk staff. Others may have a fully integrated care team that includes a care coordinator, a social worker, and a mental health professional. Those, those offices are very lucky to have those um, staff available. And we're going to look at what a care coordinator or a community health worker um, can do. To expand the role of the clinical staff, care coordinators such as community health workers play an integral part in assisting adults, children, and families in traversing the healthcare and social service system. So they work hand in hand with the doctors in the referral process. The tasks involved in the care coordination function can be incorporated into the job descriptions of a variety of staff in primary care clinics, not just care coordinators, but some of the things that care coordinators do are maintaining and updating patient and family contact information and treatment plans, which are so important, building and maintaining a resource database for social services, community-based organizations, and programs available to adults, children, and families, using a resource database like the Referral Exchange or Unite Us to refer adults, children, and families access to resources that may help them overcome social or economic barriers to health. Interfacing with the primary care team to help assess social needs in a culturally appropriate manner. Facilitating communication across all providers involved in caring for individuals and families. And the list of what the community health care workers um, does goes on and on and on. And it's so very important to have somebody to support the primary care provider in that warm handoff process if we're talking about referrals and keeping the, the patient and their treatment plan alive, active, and moving forward. Again, George, can I add something in the 
governors may revise. He's included a lot of money for community health care workers. It's going to be a growing field. So if you know people who are not wanting to be nurses or doctors, but they want to help people, that's an area that they should consider, especially if they're going to school. But uh, it's really going to be an important component of the restructuring of our Medi-Cal system. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that information, Mark. That's really great. And I, I think they really see the importance of that additional staff within the, pro within the process, within the practice, to really handhold the patient through this work. And those community uh, healthcare workers, they know the community, they are culturally aware, they're, uh, they're able to really um, handhold and, and walk the patient through what they need to with regard to referrals, getting important referrals um, uh, to mitigate toxic stress, which is uh, what that's about. Christy, yes. Quick question. So I work in the um, field of public health and I train community health workers, um, more population-based versus one-on-one. -on -one. So does this apply also to those that are working in group settings? Um, or is it more just for like referrals when working clinically, if that makes sense? Well, when you say they're working in group settings, are you talking about group, <clears throat> uh, group counseling, um, group <laughs> conversations? That, or, or, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, sorry. It's more um, so training um, community health workers to go out in our community. I work, I work for SNAP-Ed, so um, it's a lot of like nutrition and physical activity, education, access to food, et cetera. But we're trying to also bring awareness to stuff like this, um, trauma and toxic stress. So I don't know, if, like they would be out in the community working with larger audience, like a, a group setting, if that makes sense. Absolutely. You know, when you think of community health care workers, you think of educators, you think of linkages. They're, they're putting people together with the services they need to um, support their ongoing day-to-day -day activities, their activities of daily living, as well as mitigating to toxic stress. So whether they're out there it, working with groups or whether they're in the practice working one-on-one -on -one with people, those community health care workers are essential to um, keeping the process going and keeping the patients and the clients connected in a way that sometimes the practitioner doesn't have the ability to do so or to that extent. So community health care workers, care coordinators, these supplemental staff are so important. And, and if, a, if you have a practice, um, you absolutely need to consider what it may take to bring in somebody like that to facilitate some of the, um, some of the connections that they can provide. And that would also... Oh, sorry, Mark. I, I just want to add that that would include promotoras. Yes. in the community. So another great avenue for reaching out to the community through trusted folks in the, in the community. Sorry for interrupting. Right. No, Mark, you keyed on what I was going to add on to. I was also going to elaborate on, you know, after the screening is completed and the resources identified, they do play a really significant role in connecting that patient to the services um, and coordinating with them with care coordinators who can um, make sure that, you know, their resources are actually reached out to and they, they have that follow up with the community health worker as well. They really do play multiple roles that we can truly utilize when rolling out the screening here in Central Valley. Thank you, Linda. And thank you, Mark. Uh, move. Yes, Patty. Um, I'm beginning to be aware that there's a lot of different grants that are promoting peer-peer workforce. Really, I, I think essentially they're trying to enhance the integration and the referrals from um, inpatient ED to outpatient, et cetera. Is there going to be some confusion in the, in the future with so many efforts, calling it different names, peer-to-peer -peer workforce, community health workers, navigators, are they serving the same purpose to some degree? Will we be better off unifying uh, some kind of a certification that, that, that does what everything, I mean, similarities between all these terms? Does that make sense? Absolutely, yes. I, and I hear you. And, you know, language is something that is always evolving 
and changing. And as we move forward with having somebody who has a um, social perspective within the medical setting, I think those terms are evolving and will change. Um, they can be confusing, whether it's a peer, whether it's a care coordinator or a, or, or a um, community health worker. Um, it, all these things are very similar and interchangeable at some at some point. And so as we move forward, I think they will have more consistency as people begin to utilize one or the other. But right now, it can be a little confusing. Each one of those uh, different um, terms that, that we brought up, the peer, the community healthcare worker, or the care coordinator, all do the same type of work. And so it's a process of, of um, moving forward with this, with this uh, language and figuring out which one we're gonna be utilizing the most. And you know, George, I wanted to mention that um, as these workers become more recognized, there will be a point in time, I know I've read a lot about it, that there will be a certification that is recognized in many states already. I worked the state of Nevada recently uh, uh, with um, Aetna uh, on some expansion there. And um, they have a, not rigorous, it's actually a quite simple um, um, uh, certification uh, for an entry level, um, for entry level. And then as, um, as the person progresses in their career, uh, the certification becomes more and more difficult. And I believe that because the, the, these positions have been recognized with such a need in the community, that there will be a certification that will sort of even out the playing field in many ways. Great answer. And I think you're absolutely right, Teresa, on that. Because as these, as these titles move into something um, more established in terms of what they do, then we are gonna have some government control and regulation over these. The certification is one way to, to establish certain qualifications and certain standards. And I think that, Patty, will absolutely help clarify which term we're gonna be using. And thank you, Linda, for putting in the chat the um, link that you have, if you want to check that out as we move forward. I'd like to just touch on trauma-informed care principles. Trauma-informed care recognizes and responds to the signs, symptoms, and potential consequences of trauma to support the health needs of patients who have experienced ACEs and other risk factors for toxic stress. So the following key principles, which you see on your right, uh, trauma-informed care should serve as a guide for all healthcare professionals. So in bold are the key elements that you wanna think of when you think of trauma-informed care, like safety, not only for the patient, but for the staff, building trust between providers and, and patients. Uh, I think these are the foundational elements of trauma-informed care, and they're right at the top. Recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma exposure, and this speaks to education. Uh, promoting patient-centered, evidence-based care. If people are not familiar with what is patient-centered care, I think that's um, one of the most important things to, to, uh, to have as a perspective, is understanding that you are in the passenger seat with the patient, um, and not just in the driver's seat alone. Uh, ensure provider and patient collaboration. And finally, provide care that is sensitive to the patient's racial, ethnic, and cultural background, as well as their gender identity. All of these come together to make a good trauma-informed care perspective. I'd like to move forward with our implementation. I know we're almost out of time, and I want to make sure that Teresa is familiar with uh, our algorithm that we talked about. Um, so what we're going to look at is when you're actually implementing the screening tool, what does it look like and what key elements go with it to support the rollout? All right, so the screening tool has two um, routes that you can take. You can take the pediatric or you can take the adult. What we're looking at here is the Pediatric ACEs and Related Life Events Screener Tool or the PEARLS tool de-identified. Um, there, are, there are a couple different, a few different uh, PEARLS tools and I'll, I'll tell you how they break down. There's the PEARLS Child Tool, 
for ages zero to 11, and that is completed by the adults. There is the, what, that, that's what you're looking at here. There's the Pearl's Adolescent Tool, age 12 to 19, and that's completed by the caregiver, okay? Same thing right here. And then finally, there is the Pearl's Adolescent Tool completed by the adolescent. So you have three different types of screening tools for, for um, child and adolescent for pediatric care. The difference, if you're wondering between the adolescent uh, self-report and, and, and the adult report for adolescent 12 to 19, um, has two additional questions about either relationships, have they been, it's considering, have they been in relationships that have been abusive? And that is on the part two uh, to the right of uh, the 10 ACE questions on the left. I'll show you the adult tool. This is the adult de-identified. We've talked about this before. Uh, it does not have the score on the right, the, the score box on the right, which would identify which ACE or trauma they have been exposed to. It just has a total at the bottom. And I'd like respondents count the number of ACE categories on the screening tool that they or their child have experienced and indicate only the total score. So de-identified, really helpful. I have a quick testimonial I'd like to read. Um, this is a real take home message uh, that uh, a, a doctor has written. Uh, the real take home message of screening patients for ACEs, says one doctor, is that my partners who are doing this say they cannot imagine going back to the way things were. The amount of intimacy they have with their patients has increased. The comfort level with this was much easier to come to than expected. And all the clinics pediatricians now do the ACE screenings. So real positive reinforcement around uh, utilizing the screening tool. Now, what goes with the tool? Ah, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up just a moment and talk about a few conversation starters. After screening has been implemented, it is important to support the discussion of the screening and offer statements that support the patient's needs. So while, while the Becoming ACEs Aware training offers case studies on how to support patients with positive ACE scores, some other examples to note are, quote, when you filled out the questionnaire, you marked you have been through some difficult things. Many people in our community have been through a lot. If you feel okay and it's true, you can say even me or even people in my family. Some of the things to say after the screen tool, how do you initiate a conversation? Second one, can you tell me what is causing your family stress so that I can know how to help you in the best way possible? Stress is a great way word to utilize when we're talking about toxic stress. Most people don't really understand fully how toxic stress plays out, but they do understand stress, tight shoulders, and, and how they get when they feel tense. And the third one is, what is the most important thing to you that I can help with today? It's a broad question, but one that uh, can begin the conversation. So now I'd like to jump into, in our last couple minutes, this is the workflow that ACES Aware provides. It talks about how to move the screening tool from the registration to the patient and then back to the provider. Very clear. It's available at acesaware.org and it gives a very clear indication of how this screening tool flows from one person to the next, where the information goes and what is needed to be done with the information that is then provided. Um, lastly, Teresa, this is for you. This is our algorithm. The algorithm is uh, really great. The reason I like it because it, it identifies whether the, a patient is at low, intermediate, or high risk of toxic stress. This is the only thing we have because right now we do not have IO markers. What we have is this algorithm to determine where might this person be in terms of their toxic stress level. So what happens is they're given the uh, screening tool, the ACE, and they'll have an ACE score. And then the doctor will assess, do they have adverse health conditions? Now, you put those two things together, you have the score on the first line, you have the associated health conditions on the second, and this algorithm will tell you what to do with that information. For, so for example, if somebody was at a high risk, they would have a score of four or more on the screening tool. They would um, have associated health conditions with or without, it doesn't matter. Then what does the provider do? Provide education about toxic stress and link them to supportive services 
and treatment. So again, high risk, and it's gonna really make it very clear to the doctor where this person is at and um, what needs to be done uh, given that uh, where the where the uh, where the risk factor lies. So that's the algorithm. Teresa, any questions on the algorithm? I see a couple hands going up. Let's see, Patty. When when the, why doesn't Patty go ahead? I'm still uh, taking it in. Okay, excellent, Patty. <clears throat> I, I'm kind of aware of the algorithm. The only question that I have is, is that for the pediatric screening tools, you have two parts and, and I couldn't see the questions on part two. So how do you assess the different screening uh, tools for the different age groups when the number of questions are different between pediatrics and adults? Gotcha. Now, the number, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to that slide briefly just to show you. Here's the pediatrics tool. Um, what you have on the first page is the ACE questions, one through 10. Now, the score for the screening tool is only dependent on the questions on the left. The questions on the right are the social determinants of health issues. And so for pediatrics, they wanted additional questions in the, in the screener, but they're not considered in terms of the total for an ACE score. So if a child's ACE score on the left was seven and on the right, they had an additional score, all we're looking at is the seven on seven. the left. Thank you. Right. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. Uh, let me see, I thought I saw another hand here. Christy, yeah. Kind of answered my question. It was the idea of the social determinants of health on the pearls. Is that an exhaustive list? Because when I go through it, I could think of, I'm. And I'm not looking at this from like a research perspective necessarily, but I think of other potential causes of, of toxic stress, like this pandemic, et cetera. Like, how do you factor in, you know, other potential? Um, I'm assuming that's a validated, um, it's been validated, those other, what, those other questions. But I guess, could you like expand on, is there room for other potential causes of toxic stress that aren't listed on that on the on the pearls one? Oh, absolutely you know it's not an exhaustive list at all it really isn't um the problem is is that the the questions on the right for the other social determinants of health have not been as validated as the aces one through ten questions because that research study had a huge huge population over seventeen thousand people and they have they have specific um, and re, uh, relatable um, links to evident to the evidence of for those ten questions. Um, so all the social determinants of health we know increase toxic stress. We know increase uh, adverse health conditions, but they're they're just not the same in terms of how you can compare um, the evidence. Uh, so there. So what we're looking at in terms of the A score is that <clears throat> total on the left hand side only. They bring in the other questions to to supplement that ACE score, um, but uh, it's not it's not accounted in the score itself. So then, how is it intended to be used? Like, is that just to kind of get a better idea of referral, et cetera? Sure, simply informational. In fact, I'll go back to that right now and and read a couple of the questions on the right are. Uh, has your child had any problems with housing? Again, social determinants of health. Um, has your child ever been separated from their parent or caregiver due to foster care or immigration? Uh, has your child ever lived with a parent caregiver who had a serious physical illness or disability? So these questions are not the same as the ACE questions, one through 10, um, but they are supplemental and an important part of determining how might toxic stress be a part of their experience in their early development. Is that, does that help Sylvia? Does that answer your question? Um, yes. Oh, wait, oh, yes. And Chris, I can't tell, up. am I muted, mute, not muted? Yes, um, yeah, I remember this. I just haven't uh, been in one of these conversations in probably several months, so. Thank you. This is just terrific. You know, it, it's a little early for me, but I, I really love, uh, I love the idea of this and I, I do actually love it early. 
because I think that there's a different feel here at seven o'clock in the morning and uh, it feels intimate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I appreciate everybody chiming in and asking questions because that's how you can really get your, get, get the answers that you need. Um, so, and Christy, did that help out? It does help. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of it too, like from the lens of training um, the community health workers and the um, um, pr prom promotores, like how to integrate, like what that means for them. Those, the ACEs I get, the other um, uh, social determinants, like how, how I can um, train on that and provide kind of more insight into what that means. Christy, you know, there's some wording I'm going to send you, and and it really it, it clarifies it much better than I did in terms of why the one through ten questions are what they look at as opposed to the social determinants about and how they separate the two out. So I'm going to email you after this um, after this presentation, which we're about at the end of. We've got five more minutes, and um, and you'll have some you'll have some clarification with regard to the wording used. To, to separate those two. All right, um, I, I, we're gonna breeze through these. These are some of the challenges of screening for ACEs. This was given to us uh, by Family Healthcare Network from their providers directly. And, and what were some of the things that came up for them? Um, and I'm gonna, uh, our responses to these, I'm going to quickly go over. When a respondent says, I don't have enough time for the screening, the screening tool has been identified to take less than five minutes to fill out. And the provider best practice for screening implementation is during a patient's physical. Now remember, for um, 18 or younger, you can do the screening once a year and get reimbursed for that. For 19 and older, you do it one time only. So there's one assessment, um, one lifetime assessment that you do. So you're not doing this, of course, every time the patient arrives, you're doing this one time if they're an adult, multiple times if they're children, because obviously during that early development stage, um, things change rapidly. Uh, lack of provider comfort and fear of incorrect information. Providing sufficient education, as mentioned before, will help facilitate provider comfort and utilization of appropriate skills to provide needed information. And this is where the core training, the supplemental trainings, and any additional trainings you can get around trauma-informed care can help find the words necessary to make sure that you're putting out the correct information. Um, anticipatory guidance handouts specific to patient age are available within the ACEs Aware Provider Toolkit which I'm going to put in the, the um, link and offers patient education tools on building resilience, nutrition, and exercise, toxic stress, and self-regulation. Um, by Teresa, Teresa left us. Okay, glad we got to the algorithm before she left us. Um, concerns regarding strength of referral system. Having a strong network of care and a bi-directional referral system such as the King's Referral Exchange can help ease concerns our Kings County ACEs Network of Care offers opportunities to access community resources, discuss resource needs, and receive support in strengthening referral demands. Our Kings uh, County uh, Referral Exchange is that Unite Us platform that we were discussing. And the strength of that system is really um, uh, solid when you talk about having a bi-directional and a closed loop referral system. Uh, the last one I'm going to go over uh, because of the time is the fear of clinical liability and increases in case of mandated reporting. So mandated reporter laws make authorities respond to physical abuse and neglect. Part of ACE prevention is ensuring a community has an infrastructure to meet the basic needs of every child in the community. Evidence-based outcomes show that resources such as maternal home visiting programs effectively prevent both emotional and physical neglect. They also help parents control any mental illnesses and substance abuse issues they may be suffering from, eliminating another source of ACEs. Increasing in screening helps save lives and prevents neglect from starting. And that's really what we want to uh, focus on. Uh, we have just about come to the end of our uh, presentation today. I hope you have enjoyed uh, our events.
I want to leave you with the screen our resources. Uh, there's the Becoming ACEs Aware Core Training, ACEs Aware, Self Guided Clinical Supplemental Training, the ACEs 101 Clinical Link, Self Guided Non Clinical, we put those in the chat, um, and the Readiness Assessment. What I'm going to be doing is uh, offering the slides as well as the video to this presentation available after. Afterwards, I'll be sending everybody who is here a um, a uh, email to give you some more information, not only of our toolkit, but of everything that we've been listing here as a resource, because having those resources are so important. So I'll make sure to send that uh, to you after this presentation today. Um, Alicia, if I could ask that you put your name and your organization in the chat so that we have that. I've got everybody else in. And at this point, um, are there any questions, comments about the presentation, things that stuck out for you or anything you'd like to mention prior to closing? I, I wanna say that I do really believe that it helps to be in the conversation over and over and over. Um, I, like I said, I, this is for me, I think I, that my first conversation about ACEs was four years ago. I never heard of it before then, not once. And I was married to a psychotherapist at the time. And, um, and then I, just, just to let you know, I have been around people in this, this field for a long time, married to a neurologist, all of that, and never heard of ACEs. And I, I'm Kaiser, um, the people, some of these people that I'm talking about work for Kaiser <laughs> and never heard of ACEs. I never heard of it until four years ago. And so the more I'm immersed in it, the more it's just clicking, the more it starts to make sense. And I really appreciate Christy's questions because she's like, like boots on the ground, like trying to figure it out. Like, what, what do I need to do? And, you know, and it's just like, oh, okay. You know, I, I love it. So I just think that even if we had some kind of a um, little workshop where we could just put our little scenarios together like what is it that we're up to like patty had some interesting things going on and i would like to know because i live here in visalia you know my kids are so i love it so thank you so much george this is terrific you bet sylvia i really appreciate you speaking up and letting us know how you feel about this i think every conversation every presentation is a little different these morning meetings are a little bit more intimate you can pipe in um, as you can see, I've got a ton of information I, I want to get out to you, and we didn't even get to but to all of it today, um, but that's okay, because we're going to have another conversation. Next month is our next Peter Pierce session, and for those of you who have not been, I think most of you have, um, the next Monday is the Network of Care session. The Network of Care also covers a lot of ground, and is every, like I said, every conversation is slightly different and covers a little bit a different aspect of what this elephant in the room is and um and that's really what we're trying to do is to try to you know figure out how to discuss this when it's such a broad topic um toxic stress is, and and how toxic stress starts from trauma and how we deal with toxic stress um can be sometimes quite overwhelming to people so absolutely uh, next monday network of care from 2 to 3 30 and I will be sending you all that information in an email after this. So you'll have that. Uh, any other questions? There's a question about the link to the Monday session. Ah, I will send you that, Christy, yes. And what I'm doing, uh, Linda got it. She, Linda put the link in for registering for Monday's session. She got it. And there is the link to the uh, survey. We have gone over by four minutes. I, I deeply apologize for going over. This is good content. Um, click on the link before you leave for the survey. And um, when we're done here, just a couple questions about how this presentation was for you. Uh, how was the information? And uh, we appreciate uh, you completing the survey. Now, here's for the people who are left here, one last thing. If you can answer me a question, uh, we have a raffle prize, and that raffle prize is a $25 donation to the charity of your choice. Um, 
And so the question is, can you name one aspect of the readiness assessment? Name one aspect of the readiness assessment. Put that in the chat feature. And the first person to answer will be able to choose a charity of their choice to donate to. One aspect of the readiness assessment. Education, Patty. Yes, provider core training, Sylvia, excellent. Patty, you are a winner today. And what I'm gonna be doing is sending you an email um, with a list, uh, with a link to a list of charities that you can choose well, you can choose one to donate to, and we will donate to them in your name, Patty. So I know I, you've been a winner before, and we have changed our raffle prizes a couple times from the Starbucks cards to uh, Instagram. And most people have really um, uh, gravitated more towards the charities. And so we're, we're, we're doing that. I think it's really a pay it forward kind of a thing to do. All right, again, um, Make sure you take you do the evaluation. And I want to say to each and every one of you, thank you for sticking around to 815. I uh, appreciate you going over. We've got some, have had some good conversation here today. And I hope each and every one of you has a great weekend, enjoys the weather. We have some really nice weather uh, right now in the Central Valley. And have a blessed day. Keep great an eye job on. again, George. Thank you, Mark. Keep an Thank eye you. out in your email for uh, a follow-up email with all the information that I'll be sending you. Thank you so much. You bet, Patty. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.